What's up, guys? Welcome back to Cry About It, the podcast about all those sad songs that make us oh so happy. Make sure, if you guys haven't yet, follow us if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening on Spotify, Apple, wherever you're listening, uh, give us a little subscribe so that you're notified whenever the new episodes come out. We're putting them out very often now. This week, I'm super excited to be joined by a fellow Pennsylvania native, Jacob Kulik of Kulik. And Jacob and I have a little bit of history. I always like to reveal that if like there's any anything like that in the beginning of a podcast. I've booked him a couple times as a promoter. And uh, it's really cool for me to have somebody on the podcast that I've actually seen perform live. So like I can actually vouch for how incredible uh, of a performer he is live. Which Jacob, how's everything going? It's going well, man. Thank you for having me. I wanted to comment um, already on... One, I didn't know that you uh, booked me there, so that that's, that was a nice revelation. Two, I thought for sure that this was like a perfect podcast for me to be on because I make pretty much nothing but sad songs that make people happy. So, and the third one was I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. I uh, I always like to open up with with that um, podcast. Kind of was born of mental health and with everything going on in the world over the last year and a half, two years. I like to always check in on everybody right, right off the bat to make sure that everybody's doing well. So, Yeah, man. Everybody needs to be uh, checking in with themselves and be checked on. I always thought that before COVID and everything, especially now, now that this insane thing happened in our lives that we're kind of trying to pretend isn't insane and not affecting us mentally, it's absolutely affecting everybody that I know, including myself. So definitely good to check in. Without a doubt. I mean, I found myself right around January just absolutely going stir crazy. Um, the, the winter was tough this year. Really Winter's was. always tough in Pennsylvania, yeah. though, you got to say. <laughs> what, do they, what do they say? There's only, uh, there's only two seasons in Western PA. There's just snowstorms and traffic jams, and either way, they cause a delay, right? <laughs> yeah, I never heard that before, but absolutely yeah. true. Absolutely <laughs> true. Yeah, actually, like, COVID was – I, I – I hate mentioning it this way, but like COVID was good for me because I needed the break and needed the slowdown, gave me time to write and all that. But it got to a point where it was like, honestly, I felt good in my introverted self to be able to stay at home and write and not really have to, you know, spend the energy because it takes a lot of energy for me to talk to people, even interviews like this, like I'm on for a little bit and then I'm completely, you know, off. But um, yeah, it was good for a little bit, but now I'm, I'm experiencing uh, that when things are slowly opening up, that things that I learned for my anxiety to, to deal with, to be more extroverted and to deal with separation anxieties and travel anxieties and all these things, uh, I'm completely back to square one because I spent a whole year not having to do anything. So I'm like rebuilding myself. It's insane. It's, I never thought it would, I, it feels that way anyway. Maybe it'll be like real, like a lot quicker of an adjustment when things open back up again but i've noticed you know just having to do the last like like there was like three things recently that i had to do like more like in public wise or traveling wise and i was like wow this is this is much different than what it felt like a year and a half ago where i felt i had a lot more built in not rules but built in you know things that that okay if i feel anxious during this i know that i can do this to help me now i'm like oh i totally forget what i used to do you know so it's interesting interesting well i i i obviously through everything i've done for over the years i i deal a lot with artists and i think that people who don't necessarily connect with artists on a human level where you're just seeing these performers up there a lot of the artists and i would almost venture to say like 50% that I've ever dealt with are very introverted people. Like the front man of your favorite band may seem dynamic on stage and everything like that. But in person, a lot of people, especially songwriters, I find are very introverted. Yeah. Uh, I would agree with you with like literally 50% because half of the people that I've met who are artists are more like very extroverted and outgoing and love performing and love, you know, and I, not that I don't love performing, but I have much more of a, uh, I'm tiptoeing before I get to performing, like, of like, okay, making sure everything's right and like in control, like, so that, you know, my anxieties are a little bit better, but yeah, it's definitely a half and half thing. I feel way more introverted, but I will say 
you know, I, I don't want to say and use the word bipolar, but it feels very bipolar where sometimes it feels like I'm ready to go. I love this extra version, blah, 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 you know, and then there's other times where I'm like, no, I need to completely shut down. I'm much more introverted, I would say, though, for sure. Um, I, I've been trying to become more extroverted. Uh, and I also think that might have to do with I, I've been going through a lot recently in the last year or so and talking things out. Uh, with you know people that are close to me and I, I feel like maybe some of the introversion might stem from being born half deaf and not really uh, you know hearing people or wanting to interact with people I'm not sure if that played a part in it I used to just pretend I wasn't half deaf I never really even talked about it till this year so I, I think that my I just started wearing my hearing aids a year ago it's the first like time I started wearing them so I, I just think that might have to do with a little bit of the introversion, but on top of the fact that, you know, as being artists we we have very large, fun interior worlds <laughs> that right. we're kind of just always in, you know? So I had no idea. And if you don't feel comfortable talking about it, we can blow right no, You can ask that. me whatever you want. I'm trying to talk about it more actually, because I, I think it's a part of my story that I completely ignored. So you might ask me something and I might be shocked with what the answer is that I give because it's so fresh for me. Well, so like I said, I, ha I had no idea. And um, that surprises me a little bit because you are so gifted musically, right? So growing yeah. up um, and, and versus now with we wearing the hearing aids, did you hear music differently? Did you experience music differently? Like, how did you develop the, the musical skills um, with the, the hearing impairment? Uh, I think I would explain that as you don't know what you're missing if you're always missing it. Okay. So I never really knew. I had a hearing aid only in my right ear because I thought I was only half deaf in my right ear initially. Um, and I used to wear, but it was like with those big chunky ones where like, so I was like, no, nah, I can't be wearing that. And I had a good experience in elementary school, middle school came, all the bullying happened and stuff. So I was like, I'm not going to wear that. And, you know, uh, I'm just going to do this myself. So I started writing music to basically get my inner world that's up here and the internal dialogue that goes on far too often, in my opinion, out. Um, so I just kept right. I, I just started writing songs for that reason. I wasn't really thinking about how I was hearing the music or, um, I, I don't think it affected me with my writing or with, with, but I definitely not with writing, maybe with like how I was hearing the music. But mm -hmm. again, I, I didn't know I was missing it. I will say now wearing the hearing aids when I'm mixing or something, I need to have them in. Cause I, I, I can do a mix without my hearing aids for an hour and then I'll put my hearing aids in and be like, wow, that like, I, I have all the frequency that I'm missing, which is pretty much, uh, high frequencies so like female voices and hi hats and s's like those noises i don't hear as much so a lot of those end up being shrill in my mixes so with the hearing aids it made me it made me mix a little bit better but i never let it affect me and i never admitted it i just kind of wanted to get through it and pretend it didn't uh it wasn't real which is a defense that i'm trying to actively get rid of in that part of my life along with every other part of my life because it's not a good defense to just pretend it doesn't exist i mean i went to school for audio engineering like i'm, I'm i have my bachelor's of science in in engineering for mixing and mastering and i graduated top of my class like had a speech and everything and that was when i finally said like hey by the way i'm half deaf like i like i didn't want any of the teachers to know i didn't want to be treated special you know so but you know maybe maybe if i was at least honest about it to myself it would have made life a little bit easier you know it's but. incredible and, and i i think definitely like you said i mean words are words so the writing you know you probably actually had more because there was the inner dialogue that that you're able to get down on paper but then well, with the music i i'm just uh like Im impressed I, I don't know if that's right like that that you because everything I, i've i've heard from you is high level right um i think you to me, your music kind of floats in the like, you have pop sensibilities, right? To rock music um, and obviously lyric-based singer-songwriter music, but big sounds to, er to everything you've done. And I've always been so impressed by it. So to hear that um, 
impresses me that much more um, that, that it came through, especially with the recent development that you started wearing the, the hearing aids. Yeah, well, th thank you, first of all. That's very kind of you, and you s said that very well. I'm going to watch this back and quote that probably. But um, <laughs> um, no, like I – writing was not affected. Singing is a feeling more for me than it is what I'm hearing when I'm singing. So, like, it just feels good. So I didn't – and I also was not good for a lot of years. Like, you'll, if you were to ask my brothers or my parents, like, I was just singing – or as they would say, whining for like years in my like little bedroom studio that I made, you know? So it, it definitely took work. So maybe the pitch problems that I started with, like, cause I wasn't a born natural talent in the singing department, I would say. Um, so that, that wasn't affected. The writing wasn't affected. And my favorite instrument that I, in, to this day, I started with drums, the loudest instrument and it's physical and the acoustic guitar because you can feel the vibrations of the acoustic. I hate, I never, I never liked the electric guitar, even though you can get loud with the amp, it, it wasn't a feeling. Like, I think I like the things that are more, I, I don't know the word, I guess just physical. I like the, the, the physical sensations of the music. Like so even with mixing stuff, it's like mixing, like I like mixing loud with the subwoofer and like, like to really feel, that's why my songs are very, loud and big like you said like it's literally because that's what i enjoy if i'm if i'm working with a producer and they're not going to make it like that unless it's specifically like the acoustic record right th then i don't i don't like it or i don't enjoy it as much i i find the uh the vibration part interesting there is something and i'm never gonna remember the word and i like i'm 35 years old and i think like two years ago i found out this was a real thing there's certain people i understand that they like see colors when mm -hmm. they play music. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of like likens itself to that, to me. Like I've, that, when I found out that was real, like I've always heard people like when they talk about like guitar virtuosos, like they, they say like, oh, that kid like sees colors when he plays. I always thought that was just a saying. And then like somebody explained to me a couple years ago, like that's a real thing. Like this guy, like when he's playing, sees colors. So yeah, I'm my, my, uh, my, my partner, uh, April Gabrielli, and also someone who produces with me and writes with me now, she kind of has that similar thing that I was like, I don't understand that at all, but that's amazing that you can do that. It's kind of cool to work with somebody musically like that too, because, um, she'll try to explain things to me in ways that it, it, I, I it doesn't make sense to me because she hears and sees it in such a different way. You know, right. it's very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, a, I, I'm wondering, you know, because they also always say your, your body overcompensates and makes up for deficiencies, right? So right. your body may have experienced music differently. We're hearing it, you know, on the same level as like, like I'm hearing it one way, you're feeling it and your body's compensating through those feelings of the acoustic and everything like that. And, and, and maybe you were getting them that way. So I, I find you that- You know, so if it's like, if it's like proven that your body- overcompensates other things because i've always been curious about that because in all of my other senses everything's heightened and i'm overly sensitive with everything mm -hmm. every single other sense is completely heightened yep they they say that um your body will overcompensate your other senses <clears throat> to compensate for any deficiencies so if it's yeah, that's really hearing, interesting then, then your sight and smell or if it's if your sight then you're hearing um generally um but then there's also people who are have multiple deficiencies but they say that if there's one the other strengthen because they're compensating your brain compensates for it so i did also hear that like people who are fully deaf they like really they really um they really feel all the other senses too so maybe i have like a little taste of that what's interesting about mine though is that like it's so i say 50 percent deaf because uh, most people here at 20 decibels and i hear at 40 decibels and it's different on the frequencies but for me it's like i'm like half deaf so it's like i always thought like am i making this up like okay like there's people that have it way worse than me my thing must not be real like like i i didn't validate it at all you know because yeah. it wasn't like enough for me to be like okay this is a real thing you know but now now i'm i'm coming more to terms with a lot of things in my life that like okay that is real that is how i feel oh i actually am anxious in some situa situations i'm not making up that i'm anxious you know like there's a lot of different mental things that happen that i'm starting to like accept and understand now 
I think that's great. Um, like I said, this podcast born of, of mental health. So anything that anybody's doing to take care of that aspect of their life, I think it's so important. And I'm so glad that like when I was in high school, like that was so stigmatized, you know, like that wasn't a thing yet. It, it just wasn't open. And I talked about it with a couple of people on this podcast that I'm so glad that mental health is in the forefront and there's no stigma. There's no like, it's not, it's not being ignored like it was for so long. And, and people are, are using that. So I, I think we're reining it in because I will say, I felt like no one was talking about it. And I used mental health as a platform kind of when I, especially when I started, like when I launched cool, I was like, I'm going to talk about this because I felt like my entire childhood up until that moment, I was never able to talk about it. Now that we're able to talk about it, I feel like, I feel like we're, we're getting closer. To, first of all, you should always be able to talk about it. Um, but I feel like we're, 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 we're getting closer to being able to talk about it and process it health in a healthy way. But sometimes I think people overthink about it now, overthink about their mental health. And that's actually not good for your mental health, you know, where it's like, oh, um, you know, like, like, like I overthink so many things now because mental health is such a, such a, uh, uh, not trending topic, but it's such a popular topic now that I feel like I talk about it more than I actually wish I wanted to. Right. If that makes sense. Cause I'm like actually overthinking it now. So it's an interesting balance of like pay attention, but also like go with the flow a little bit and right. then check in and then go. It's it, it, you know, life's a balance. You can't just always be, Oh, I'm worried about how I'm feeling. I'm worried about how I'm feeling, worried about how I'm feeling. You're just going to worry yourself to death. So like there, there's a, there's a balance, you know, for me anyway, I, I found that. I think for everybody in life, balance is so key. So yeah, I, I really like how you worded that. that that's great. So then <clears throat> I'm going to backtrack a little bit and uh, everything got shut down last year. I feel like you were on all cylinders and just kind of hitting the road. Obviously, I mean, we're both coal, coal region guys. So I really um, was following your career and, and, and I, I very interested in it. Um, and I, I feel like you were hitting the ground running. Everything was kind of clicking and then COVID hit, right? And I mean, the whole music industry shut off. How, how, how did you deal with that? And what are the plans moving forward now to try to, try to get everything going again? Yeah, uh, so that was horrible. Right. <laughs> I'll start with that. That was horrible. I'm still processing that for sure because like the, for people who don't know what my story was, basically it was like, got signed major label signing got a tour with sleeping with sirens in 2018 i believe it was acoustic tour then got a tour with andy black and the fame 2019 had a couple headlining tours we're building momentum we're getting songs on the radio it's charting all this stuff and then um basically uh left the major label decided to sign with my manager's label nc records which i love indie label I can do more of what I'm able, what I'm able to do more of what I want to do. Right. And then COVID hit. So I had all this upward momentum and I don't feel like I got knocked down and I have to go back up, but some days it does feel like that where it's like, okay, well now what do I do? It's almost like I'm, I'm, it's interesting. Cause it, some days I feel like I failed and now I have to build myself back up. And other days I feel like, all right, I got to a place, it paused. And now just like anything else, when you slow down for a little bit, it takes a little bit to get the gears going again, you know? Um, and also I think that has to do with the fact that I recorded like yelling in a quiet neighborhood in my, my record. I was finished that in November of 2019. Right. It got released in 2020 it's now 2021 and I released an acoustic record based off of yelling in a quiet neighborhood. So it's like, I'm ready now to go back into self-discovery back into myself and, and write new songs about, you know, what my, my core beliefs are again, not about, you know, um, and you know, not, not about, not about my, my past relationships and not about this stuff, like more about, you know, who I am as a person, how to grow, how to be better. That's, that's my, that's my thing. That's what I like talking about. Right. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, we got to get tours. 
it's easier to get towards when you have momentum, when you have all those stats. So that's difficult because now that's one part that it really is heavily affected because it's like, okay, when someone looks at me as an artist and they don't know my story, it, they see a different picture than someone who does know my story of like, okay, like this is still going. It's like, oh, this person hasn't toured because no one has, you know, but the only thing you can really look at right now is analytics, streaming numbers and all that. So that's why you have to try to, you know, push those numbers and get those up there. But for me, it's like, all you can do is keep creating and, and keep pushing content. And honestly, the appreciation from my core fans has been so good that it's, the, I, I personally think I will be honest is honestly, I think that's the only reason why I haven't been like, you know, what, screw it. I'm just going to stop doing this. Cause when I actually release stuff, there's still people that reach out to me that are like, this hits me here. And this is what this does for me. And I'm like, all right, so I still have it, man. I just got to keep, you know, just got to keep at it and be persistent. I think, I, I think the, you know, I'm, I'm nobody to talk about it, but I have friends from all levels of the music industry and in every aspect of it, everybody was hit pause. Right. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how everything comes back. And I think there's going to be traffic jams of touring when it goes out. Cause everybody's going to try to hit the road. Right. Cause everybody's been on furlough. Basically. That's already happening too, by yeah. the way, like there's, there's tours that are booked that no one knows about and they're just waiting to see if the venues will open, you know? So exactly. ab ab absolutely. So it, there, it's that combined with, the anxieties of, oh man, I haven't gone anywhere in a year and a half. And now I have to be good with the, you know, it's like, do I really want to do all this again? Like, are we ready to go? And I mean, you're going to build momentum and it's going to happen. Like I know what's going to happen. It's just, I'm anxious about it. I'm right. excited. But just, you know, and I, 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 I mean, just to fill people in, you, you, you were with R RCA mm -hmm. major label, put mm -hmm. out the record. And then, like you said, you you're now on N NC, which mm -hmm. I've been interviewing a couple people from that label recently. Very cool label. Um, love the roster that's developing. And like you said, I, I wasn't aware that that was your manager as well. But yeah, great situation, right? I mean, oh, I felt, in my opinion. Yeah, I completely was lucky with that. Because whenever I think back on that, I'm like, if I didn't have my manager and he wasn't starting label, I don't really know where I would have gone or what I would have done, you know? My, my situation was different too, because most people, they get, uh, this is where luck struck for me, because most people get, you know, they tour for a lot of years and, and then they finally get recognized by an indie label and then you build your numbers and build up and then maybe a, a major label get, recognizes you and you build up and build up and then you get signed. I worked at, at CBS radio and um, I basically met someone who knew the EVP of RCA Records named Joe Riccatelli, great guy, still friends with him, amazing human being. And I, I was able to get a meeting with him by lying and say that I was supposed to have a meeting with him. And he said, I'll be free in 15 minutes. So I just went, but um, yeah, so I played him music and he eventually signed me to RCA. So I didn't, I never toured before sleeping with sirens. Like that was my first tour. So uh, I, I think being so green and unexperienced is it's such a different experience that even when I talk to other artists and like I, no one relates to it because it's such a, it's, it's the lottery. Yeah, I hate the, the, the panic at the disco model. How did they do it? I, I don't know anything about that. Similar situation. Um, awesome uh, record. Obviously I'm, uh, closing the goddamn door, like all, all those hit songs yeah, yeah, yeah. were put up on MySpace. Pete Wentz found them on MySpace, signed them, Fueled by Ramen, put them on tour with Fall Out Boy and all the big bands at that time and, and kind, of, kind of went from there, right? And uh, Like the old school uh, TikTok, except, in, except, uh, <laughs> except it was based on the music, I'll say. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. For the most part. Yeah, exactly. But right. <laughs> but yeah, I, it, it's, it's cool to hear those different stories. I, everybody has a different way that they broke or got discovered. So it, it's really neat when, when you hear one like that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing what your influences for music are. So when I hear your songs, I hear in, uh, and it's your inspiration, obviously, but like I hear notes of everything from like Coldplay to Imagine Dragons to Jack's mannequin to Andrew McMahon in the wilderness. Like I, I hear little bits and pieces where I can be like, Oh, that kind of sounds like that, but it's all its own. But like I said a little bit earlier, it, it's big, it's an, an anthemic. It's, 
it, it's a big sound and, and I love that. And it's like you said, it's, it's sad in some of it, but there's a positivity underlying all of it, which really draws me into the music. Yeah. Um, I will say too, before I mention the influences, like the, with the big sound thing, I think when you're writing a sad song or it doesn't have to be sad, it has to be emotional. That's what I'll say. It's an emotional song. Cause like even the song colors, it's not sad, it's emotional. And I think if you want your listener to really feel something, it should be for me anyway, it should be big. Yeah. You know, if, it, if it's, I, I like getting, I, I like coming across like that, mm -hmm. but um, it's funny. My inspirations, I've never, I always was the naive kid that wanted to make music that sounded like no one else and was completely original. So I tried to not really listen to music, especially when I was trying to make music. Um, the artist I listened to, Tom Petty, a, a, a ton. I mean, like the first thing I ever listened to was Tom Petty's greatest hits. It was on a record player. I mean, on a, on a tape player. Um, love Tom Petty. Uh, and it was all over the place too. It was like Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, loved pop, loved that Ricky Martin, loved that too. Loved 80s music like Bon Jovi, was a huge fan of Bon Jovi, Ario Speedwagon. So I jumped all over the place in what I really liked. But for my, my project, Kulik, and what I'm sounding like, whenever people ask me about my inspirations, I actually didn't really, I was not trying to model after anybody. I was trying to just, hey, here's my lyric and my melody. I don't really know anything about producing. That's why when I was at, um, with RCA, like I was working with other producers. And they produced me in that way at first. You know, like Dave Cass was my first producer I worked with who did, uh, and Pete Nappy did Ghost, but Dave Cass did Colors and Hole in My Head. So I kind of learned from them how they produce. And I was like, I like that, but let me also include these elements that I have too. You know, like the acoustic guitar, I really like, I like the um, um, layered vocals, you know. But yeah, I mean, inspiration wise, I love, I love Imagine Dragons. I love 21 Pilots. Um, I've been getting into a lot of newer artists as well because I'm trying to, you know, I want to, I want to still sound modern but still keep my sound too. So I've been trying to play around with other stuff. But yeah, I definitely like the older music better. I'm trying to find ways to layer organic instruments like guitars and the real drums and all that with instruments that aren't organic and samples, so that it's like this hybrid of I don't know what I'm listening to, but I love it. That's what I want. <laughs> So I, I definitely, um, everything you named there, I, I, I think it's, it's fascinating. So I love to just like how people develop their, their musical, um, ability, taste, everything like that. And, and there's a sense, there's a pop sensibility to your music that I always appreciate, but at the same time, it's, it's rock and roll music to me, right? Like, like it, I, I don't listen to a lot of pop. I'm like hip hop or, or rock but mm -hmm. I appreciate pop for being like, like I always tell people like whenever somebody dumps on like a, a pop song, I'm like, you don't understand. Like that's a science formula. Like so much went into writing that. Like there's like 10 people that wrote it and production and, and that's why it's addicting and, and yes. it's catching you. So anybody that I can, can appreciate a pop song like that too. Like that's what I was going to say is you don't need to necessarily like the song, but you can appreciate like pop music. I don't necessarily love my voice being in that bed, but pop music always just sounds like the melody and like a drum kit, but there's so much going on. Like if you listen to Britney Spears, like instrumental songs, like, like just the instrumentals, there is so much going on, but if you're not listening closely, it's just the melody and drum. So that's what I try to take from pop and then put it into a little more of a, a rock, uh, lane you know right but i also i always wanted to be on radio and i always wanted to sing catchy songs i don't i don't it's just not for me to listen to music that doesn't get stuck in your head like i can appreciate a band like dream theater i don't want to make dream theater music right you know I, I, like, I, like, I, those, those kind of bands that play nine minute songs yeah. and like it's so technical like I, I don't even know what i'm playing half the time i just know it sounds right and feels right and that's it you know so I, I appreciate that so much. Um, I feel like some artists, especially in the rock genre, and I think it's kind of with, with platforms like YouTube and, and podcasts and everything, I think it's getting out there, this idea a little bit more, but I feel like a lot of artists are held back just by 
being a rock artist or being a punk artist or whatever. And like, there's like this weird mentality of like, if you make it, then like you did something wrong that like gets embedded in like these high school teenager kids that are making music. And I've always like, like I've told bands like you're, you're like when the sellout thing comes out, like that should be your goal. Like don't change who you are. But, like, go sign that big deal and, like, make a living off of music because if you could do what you love, do it and don't ever feel ashamed for it. You're trying to make a living. Right. So that, like, to me, the only time someone's really selling out is if they're giving in and giving up what they want their content to be about. So your subject matter, you know, that, that is the only thing that's important to me. If you're singing about something that's not important to you, now you sold out. Exactly. Cause now you're just singing whatever, like even if someone else wrote the song for you, for me, it's like, if you relate to that and you can, you can be a voice to that. Like I re- I released a song called H that, um, uh, a young lady that I knew from high school passed away from a heroin overdose. She wrote a poem. I made it a song. I didn't write that, but I can understand what it's like to have demons inside of you. I can understand what it's like to have longing. Like that's what this poem is, you know? So if you can, make music and stay on your true path or or at least subject matter to me you're, you you'll never sell out i don't care what the song sounds like it's like is this who you are if you're if you're someone who is an incredible vocalist and sings like disco music then that's what it is and if you if it takes you 20 years to figure that out you didn't sell out when you hit that like you finally found what you like making there's nothing wrong with that you just got to write what you actually what that's, that's the only thing I don't necessarily like about pop music is I think there's, there's some artists, which I hope people can see through that bullshit of like, all right, this person's just singing, you know? Oh, without a doubt. Well, that's so refreshing. I just want to put that out there in the world to, to hear an artist speak like that. Um, and I, I don't even broach that topic very often because there's so many, it's just a mentality that, that is in the rock genre in general. So when you said that. I don't remember experiences that a lot. Like they remember, I didn't mention that, but they're like one of my favorite bands. Like I used to, I, I mean, I still listen to them. I love their, their new record. I like like a couple of the songs from it. I still don't consider them selling out. Their fans are always like, you guys suck. How, I don't understand how can a band have a fan base that literally says you guys suck. It's like, you're the fans. Like you I'm need also, to support the band. <laughs> I'm also a huge Day to Remember fan. One of the, uh, I I also do like YouTube videos on like certain topics that are out there. And one of my biggest videos is on that last Day to Remember um, album album that came out. And it's me just being like, basically that, like, listen, these guys like went through like PTSD with a label that was like crushing them for years. Now they're on a, a, a new label. They're allowed to write the music they want. Like they're happy this is what came of it. They went back to Florida. Like there's a little bit of country in there. There's some pop, like let them live and let them write the music they want. And guess what? That's probably, I think in retrospect, going to end up like this album or the next album being their biggest albums ever. Cause there's some crossover potential where like modern rock can play those songs finally. And you have to understand they're trying to make a living. (laughs) Like you want to be commercially successful. That's not selling out. That's not selling out, you know, like, cause I have a friend actually who was able to get in a room with them and, and try to co-write a song that didn't make the record in Nashville. And he was saying like, yeah, like they're trying to, to they're, they're trying to write songs that are still good songs, but they're trying to have songs that are crossover that can be played on radio that, that can have some kind of success, you know, like I love screamo music. I absolutely love screamo music. Love the, the hardcore stuff. It doesn't really pay that much unless you plan on touring your entire life which is also cool and fine but that compared to also having the added income of like you have a little bit of success over here with like in television or on radio or something it's a business music is a business and you can't get pissed off at artists for trying to participate in the business that they are in (laughs) you know so i'm i'm pretty good friends um where I'm comfortable enough to, to, to say this with uh, JT from Hawthorne Heights, like mm-hmm. Hawthorne Heights hit screamo music at the peak of screamo music. Right. Mm-hmm. And they're still out there now having to grind it because it never was able to, to get commercially. I mean, they had about as much commercial success as any screamo band could ever have. Right. They, they had enough pop sensibilities in there. 
but those guys would, would tell you the same exact thing. And he put out a couple albums after that, just solo. And I remember him talking to fans and being like, listen, like it's, it's not Hawthorne Heights. I'm trying to do something new. Um, right. So I completely agree uh, at a certain point you need, you need to, to do that. Well, dude. And uh, honestly, like, we get older, people get older. You don't want to grind all the time. Like you still need to do other stuff. I was going to mention like bring me the horizon. That's a band that for some reason, most people aren't shitting on They're They're, they're like, Oh, we love the new bring me the horizon. It's still crossover. It's not screamo anymore. Like, why is that? Okay. Is it because they just nailed it? Cause I think that they just nailed it. You know, like their, their, their music sounds incredible, but they nailed the crossover of not sounding like they went too far. You know, a hundred percent. So I have, uh, I have a video about that too, but <laughs> <laughs> I swear I didn't watch yeah. these. No, 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 it's cool. <laughs> I, I love it. So like, these are top, like the stuff that I'm passionate about. So like agreed, I think they absolutely hit it right. Full, full on hit it. I would say there's like, like a day to remember just fell a little bit short of, of nailing it. Right. There's just a little bit too far or something in there. But mm-hmm. yeah, I think that like the first, two three weeks that bring me the horizon came out like there was a little bit of that like what 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 is this like like people were like calling it edf like people were like upset about it and Mm -hmm. now you're looking back like in retrospect and everybody's calling it like the most influential album of the last five years and like they're the model to follow and exactly and that's gonna probably end up being like one of their biggest albums ever yeah way more commercially yeah. successful than anything else because it brings new people into the fold. Like your core fans are going to come along or eventually um, because they're your core fans. There's a reason there. always bringing new people in is what does it. And that's why the people who came out of the scene that I came from in the early two thousands, like Paramore, like Paramore doesn't sound anything like they used to. They're mm-hmm. almost a new wave band, like with some of the stuff they put out, mm-hmm. but they're a pop band too. And they're putting out, whatever is hot they're kind of teetering the line there and and they've made a better career than most people i'll I'll say i'll say two things one humans evolve the bands evolve too and two again we get older maybe jeremy mckinnon the singer of a day to remember doesn't want to scream so much anymore you know he's a dad he's a little bit older he has to go on tour and do these things i don't know how bring me the horizon is live i have no idea if he can do that i don't know what his age is i don't know enough about them to really talk about it yeah. but like i, I understand it because even with me like growing up compared to what i used to sing when i was 18 versus now like i'm changing what i what i play because of personal taste whatever is evolving with my personal taste what i can actually do physically whether it's better or 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 not better but you know like whether i like, like I, I actually, um, I found that I really enjoy singing in falsetto. Like I'm writing a lot of stuff with falsetto. That's, that's something different. That's someone, I mean, you know, like, it's not like I have a huge following, like they remember where I'll have a massive uproar, you know, which I'm kind of fortunate about, but <laughs> you know, it's like, let, let the people make the art. And if you don't like it, there's a million other artists. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I we can move on, but I, I just, uh, data remember. I'm glad we touched on it. I'm glad yeah. we touched on it, but go ahead. A day to remember, I think, for so long wrote that angry music, and it's it's got to be really hard at this point in life for those guys to have much to be angry about. Yeah, you exactly. Know? They they did the damn thing, you know. <laughs> right? They they got out of a hellish contract, and 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 the only thing you see in there and that I I still see is a little bit about like the money aspect, and and yeah, they can they had they can have that sour taste because they should have. The contract they had was terrible, so I, I totally get it. Right. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on, since we, uh, so you're from the Skook, right? You're from, I am Google from the County, Skook, right? Yeah, I am. I don't look like it, but I am. Yes. So <laughs> I, I'm from I'm from Scranton. I, I I live reside in Harrisburg area now, but um, what? My first, yeah. Okay, we'll talk about that when we get off here. But go uh, ahead. <laughs> so I uh. I, when I first moved here, I worked in Schuylkill County. Okay. I worked in Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. What were you doing? Like selling iced tea and cigarettes? What were you yeah, I was working. Uh, I was actually marketing. Um, okay. Huge, <laughs> huge window. Like one of the biggest window and door manufacturers in the world is, is right off of exit 100 on 81 there. Um, mm-hmm. okay. Solar Innovations, shout out. Um, and they also made like fishing reels. They bought pen reels when that went out um, around there or whatever. But uh, I had a... a 
a kid that worked in the cubicle next to me, I got kind of close with. And I went out a couple times in Schuylkill County in Wummelsdorf, which when he told me he lived there, I thought it was like Harry Potter, like some, something from Harry Potter. Sounds like. But what a, what a, what a fascinating world um, Schuylkill County is. I've, I've never heard of that town. Uh, yeah. I'm from the town Tamaqua, which is still Google, uh, Schuylkill County. But it, yeah, it's basically just, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a very old town that never uh, evolved. Not the people, the town, um, where it just kind of looks like it's the same era that when they built it and a lot of drug problems. And then you drive out of that town and it's just all farms. And I basically grew up, I grew up, in between the towns and the farms and it was kind of like even like like where i lived didn't fit in with like what was surrounding because i'm not from a farm but i'm still like when i meet new people they consider me like to be more hick and more and more uh country and i'm like i'm not really that like i know people that are more country than me that's the only reason why i think that you know but schuylkill county is an interesting place um It'll always be the place that I was born. Uh, I don't relate a lot to the area or the uh, socialization there. It's, but you know, I, I I think I had to leave there and kind of explore the world to understand that hey, I'm different than this town, but there's a lot of people that are similar to me in the entire world and. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. So if anybody like listening, I always want to say this, like anybody listening who feels like where they're from, I don't even know if this happens anymore with social media and, and with like everything being like more accepted. But if you feel like you don't fit in with your town or your family or, you know, where you grew up, you can absolutely find your community of people and your, your, your journey, your journey is just starting where, where, where you're from. It's not, you don't need to stay in the bubble. The bubble should, should be burst. I, I completely agree, though, because I'm from a small coal town outside of Scranton called Carbondale um, mm-hmm. as well. And same thing. I mean, they're all the I same place, man. They're all hotbeds of the same stuff, you know? Exactly. And then, you know, it, it took me leaving there and, and you know, traversing the, the world to really figure out what I wanted and who I was. And um, I think that that's a great message to put out there to, to anybody. And now you got a sick fish tank, man. Yeah, that's my uh that's my that was my quarantine project i uh dude it's um, sick i love fish i'm just I've, i'm not even like talking or listening i'm just watching the fish it's like two chasing each other <laughs> oh yeah. you can change the lights look at that oh yeah we can go we can go all different colors but uh that was my <laughs> my wife was a little nervous when i cut the hole in the wall but um once she saw the finished product she was she was happy with it so uh that's been my you know my my dream since I was a kid to have a fish tank in the wall for some reason. And congratulations. That means you made it right. Like I feel like when I was a kid, I was like, anybody's house that had a big fish tank. I was like, they must be rich. (laughs) (laughs) Which that was the case. I know. I know. I know. (laughs) I got a really good deal on Facebook marketplace and, 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 and cut a hole in the wall. Looks great. Looks great. A couple YouTube videos later, this is the finished product. But, um, (laughs) so I, I found real. I'm just gonna look at my note here, just because I'm I'm terrible with album names. I love music. Um, oh, I wanted to give you props too. You're like the only person who ever pronounced my name right. They always say Kulik or Kulik. Oh, really? Kulik. It's not hard. It's cool. So, I even put it in my Instagram bio. It's the first thing in my Instagram bio. It's the pronunciation of my name. No one even goes to look. But yeah, well, I'll, I'll attribute that <laughs> to to you know Cole Cracker. Um, you know pronunciation. Maybe, straight, maybe that's it. Straight fanatics, right? Um, so I come <laughs> when I came down here, I would say Lancaster, and everybody mm. would look at me like I was nuts and yell at me. It's it's Lincoln. I still can't say it, right? I I, I just can't say it. Lancaster. Lancaster, however they say it. Uh-huh. But um, I I loved the juxtaposition of you taking uh, yelling in a quiet neighborhood and then making an acoustic and calling it sitting in a quiet coffee house. So I know that that's the, the new, the newest release. Yeah. I love, I love that. Like that, that hit me immediately. Why was it important for you to take those songs and, and, and give them the acoustic feel? Um, well, I will say that that, that album is probably the most important so far in my life of documenting what I was going through 
And um, I, even when I wrote it and recorded it and listened to the album, the full album, I, I kind of still wasn't processing that that was me and that's what I went through and that's what I felt, you know? Um, so I think the acoustic record gave me a chance to really like read the lyrics again as me, not as someone outside of me looking in. And it kind of just made me like, give me full closure on the situation and um, just experience the songs again for, you know, I will say too, <clears throat> it gave me a chance to experience the songs again, but it made me feel like a kid again because I went back to okay I'm gonna record with an acoustic guitar which is what I started doing when I was young you know like like making songs now with full productions I can start with just a track and start doing all things electronic so it got me back into tapping into um, using the guitar as an instrument and just singing with just an acoustic you know so it was it was really it was a nice experience honestly and I love chill acoustic music um, it was really fun to do. I, I, I plan on doing more in the future, even if, even if it's on a, another full length album. Um, that, that's definitely been my first voice ever in music. And I, I liked tapping back into that. I thought the songs translated great. Um, I've listened to, I've been li like, um, as research, however you want to put it, like I've been listening to a lot of your music over the last week, two weeks and, um, kind of digesting it. I've listened to them to the both the albums and i think that the songs like i said like what attracted me originally was the big big sound but i think they're they're such strong songs and i've always been a lyric guy um i feel like i say that every every episode um i connect to lyrics i connect to words um songs with meaning mean more to me um than just like background music right mm -hmm. so i i think that the songs come across and in some cases i i, I picked up on completely different themes um, on the acoustic version or, or they had different meaning to me, um, in the acoustic than I did with the, the full. So I'm, I'm, yeah, they, they, they honestly had different meanings when I re-recorded them. Like crawling was very desperate when I wrote that for the full version. And then when I did it for the acoustic version, I was like, this is more like acceptance and like, let's make this more like lazy and lounged back, you know? Also like, it was more fun for me. Um, cause there's certain parts in the full versions, like lead instruments that I was like, okay, how can I make this an acoustic guitar riff or how can I make like still use the same melodies, but use completely different instrumentation. So like crawling was one of my favorite ones to do, honestly, because that, that guitar riff is so different. It's such a different feel, you know, um, even like waiting for you, like waiting for you acoustic is totally like I'm sitting at the beach, just singing this, you know, to the person. It's not it, like, whereas waiting for you, with the full production was more like, I want this to hit you, you know? Like, I really want this to, like, I, I need you to feel that I'm feeling this way. Whereas the Waiting For You version was like, okay, I have this now. Like, now I'm just kind of playing this for you. Like, this isn't like, you know, you need to feel this anymore. It's like, I know you feel this. You got this now, you understand that. So, yeah, it was really cool. I love it. And I I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure that other people have have done something similar, but in my mind, like that's the first time I've ever listened to an album basically full, full way through of all the songs um, in full production and then gone back and listened to the, the acoustic accompanying one like that. And I, it was, it was a cool experience just as a listener to do I that. I appreciate you doing that. Cause that's the point of it. You know, it's supposed to be this collection of work and then now this collection of work, you know, I also wanted to prove that I didn't need to have the huge wall of sound for the song to be good. So that was like a cool thing. I completely like, so what's always stuck out like from the first time I listened to your stuff. So I was originally turned on to you by Ryan Soroka. Mm -hmm. um, I've known Ryan. Since, agent, yeah. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. But I, I've known, so I've known Ryan since he was like the 16 year old kid that was like pushing through AIM for me to book uh, the dangerous summer. And, and it wasn't even like <laughs> that long, man. That's oh, I, insane. Yeah. I, yeah. I've known Ryan since probably like 2008. Um, cool. If not, before that um and he was like we back then we would you know do aim conversations like to to quicken up booking stuff um mm -hmm. but he he originally just sent your music like sent you to me before there was ever a booking request it was like hey like this guy's from your area isn't he like check check him out and uh i i've, I've always appreciated the song writing um all the way through it uh and then i jumped which i wish more I wish more booking agents actually listened to what they booked 
um, I'm a big artist development guy. And I think that, that I would rather work with an artist when they're coming in and, and build them in the, in a market, like the way it used to be done. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe in that, like in, from my core <clears throat> and, uh, I, I, I appreciate whenever like a, a booking agent, believe it or not, never even like I get numbers, but I'm booking music and I'm a booking agent that I don't do it full time anymore. So I only book stuff that I'm passionate about or believe in. Right. Um, I, I owned a venue uh, called Eleanor Rigby's in Northeast PA for many years and I sold it because I couldn't do that anymore. I, I couldn't do metalcore and dubstep and take anxiety attacks from the bass every weekend. So, uh -huh. I, so I, <laughs> I understand that. You know, yeah. Yeah. So I moved past that and uh, I, I, I was connected to your music. So hearing the acoustic songs, like I always knew you as a, as a songwriter, like even, even the full production, I was always like, this kid's a songwriter. And um, I, I had a whole newfound appreciation for the raw um, stripped down versions of those songs. So I think anybody that's maybe checking out this podcast and hasn't heard your music, listen to both albums because they both are something so impressive and, and stand on their own. And like I said, I, I got different meanings out of different songs, different emotions evoked listening to, to the same song in different um, compositions. So it's really satisfying to hear you say that because that's literally the point of why I re why I released the music. <laughs> you know, it's like because because what what I was writing about is super personal and very for myself. You know, so putting it out and then knowing someone else can also relate to it, uh, it means that I hit all the marks for me because it's like I wasn't specific too specific where no one can relate to it. I wasn't so vague that it didn't mean anything at all, you know, so that, that I appreciate that. And I hope that anybody who does check it out gets the same experience that you did. Absolutely. So I, I apologize. We we've had a great conversation and I feel you like I've, I've kept all. you longer than, than uh, we originally intended, but I want to let you know that you're welcome back anytime on the podcast. Um, I'm sure we will cross paths more uh sooner rather than later with everything opening back up um absolutely but i want everybody to go to spotify check out the songs give them a listen apples down apple download them um i really like i said i i the same thing with booking i don't have people on the podcast if i don't i get pitched interviews all day and i don't um have them on so i actually when this came across i i emailed immediately and was just like hey i would really like to do this interview um First, just because like I felt the connection from booking you before, but then also really enjoyed the music and anybody that's uh, from a coal town, I like to help uh, shine any light on I can. So, yeah, um, man, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I respect you as a person and as a professional, and I would love to be on again. Um, and yeah, I hope everybody checks out the music and we're going to get back to it. We're going to get back to booking gigs and, uh, you know. Just, just as soon as everything opens back up, hopefully I get to see everybody again. So, Absolutely. So if you guys made it this far, please remember to hit that subscribe button. Give it a like. Leave a comment down below. If there's a really cool comment on the YouTube video, I'll pass it along to Jacob. Maybe I can get you an answer there. And, Absolutely. Um, I appreciate everybody for listening. We will see you next week.